in this study material i am going to discuss hopkins sonnet god's grandeur the poem the world is charged with the grandeur of god it will flame out like shining from shook foil it gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed why do men then now not wreck his rod generations have trod have trod have trod and all is seared with trade bleared smeared with toil and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell the soil is bare now nor can foot fail being shot and for all this nature is never spent there lives the dearest freshness deep down things and though the last lights of the black west went oh morning at the brown brink eastward springs because the holy ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with a uh, bright wings let me introduce the poet hopkins gerard manley hopkins was a brilliant christian poet hopkins was born in 1844 in essex england he began writing in elementary school and went on to study at oxford while studying there he decided to become a jesuit priest so he temporarily gave up writing to study theology he experimented with new rhythm he produced a small number of finely crafted and moving poems in his lifetime but for religious reasons made little effort to publish them when they were published 29 years after his death by robert bridges Hopkins quickly took a place of honor among modern poets. His radical and difficult experimentation with diction, sound, syntax and rhythm made him especially attractive to early 20th century poets. Though his poems seem difficult, they are accessible to patient readers who are willing to inform themselves about Hopkins' traditional Christian beliefs. Now let us look at the form of this poem. This poem is an Italian sonnet. It contains 14 lines divided into an octave and a sestet, which are separated by a shift in the argumentative direction of the poem. Like all Italian sonnets, in the beginning of the sestet, there is a volta or turn, that is a change in the argument being put forward. This is often signaled by the word but or et at the head of the ninth line here we have the phrase and for all this the meter here is not the sprung rhythm for which hopkins is so famous but it does vary somewhat from the iambic pentameter lines of the conventional sonnet the rhyme scheme is a b b a a b b a c d c d c d here is a synopsis of the poem The poem begins with the surprising metaphor of God's grandeur as an electric force. The figure suggests an undercurrent that is not only always seen but which builds up a tension or pressure but occasionally flashes out in ways that can be both brilliant and dangerous. The first four lines of the octave describe a natural world through which God's presence runs like an electric current. becoming momentarily visible in flashes like the refracted glintings of light produced by metal foil when rumpled or quickly moved alternatively god's presence is a rich oil a kind of sap that wells up to a greatness when tapped with a certain kind of patient pressure given these clear strong proofs of god's presence in the world the poet asks how it is that humans fail to heed his divine authority the second quatrain within the octave describes the state of contemporary human life the blind repetitiveness of human labor and the and the sordidness and the stain of toil and trade 
the landscape in its natural state reflects God as its creator, but industry and the prioritization of the economic over the spiritual have transformed the landscape and robbed humans of their sensitivity to those few beauties of nature still left. The shoes people wear sever the physical connection between their feet and the earth they walk on, symbolizing an ever-increasing spiritual alienation from nature. The sestet, enacting a turn or shift and in argument, asserts that, in spite of the failings of Hopkins' contemporary Victorian world, nature does not cease offering up its spiritual indices. Permeating the world is a deep freshness that testifies to the continual renewing power of God's creation. This power of renewal is seen in the way morning always waits on the other side of dark night. The source of this constant regeneration is the grace of a God who broods over a seemingly lifeless world with the patient nurture of a mother hen. This final image is one of God guarding the potential of the world and containing within himself the power and the promise of rebirth. With the final exclamation, Hopkins suggests that suggests both an odd intuition of the beauty of God's grace and the joyful suddenness of a hatchling bird emerging out of God's loving incubation. Here is a critical analysis of the poem. The sonnet God's grandeur stresses the immanence of God. The whole universe is an expression of God's greatness, but man fails to recognize it. Though the soil is bare and smeared with man's toil, there is a constant renewal or natural beauty because God continues to brood over the world. In this sonnet, Hopkins praises the magnificence and glory of God in the world, blending accurate observation with lofty imagination. The world is filled with the greatness of God. God's glory expresses itself in two ways. Sometimes it flames out with sudden brightness when a gold foil is shaken. At other times, the poet thinks of an olive press with the oil oozing from the pressed fruit. It oozes from every part of the press in a fine film and then the trickles gather together to form a jar of oil. In the same way, the grandeur of God is found everywhere, trickling from every simple thing in a created universe and accumulating to form greatness. The poet wonders why people do not care about God's rod. People pursue their worldly activities without any thought of God's will and without the fear of God's anger. Generations of human beings have followed the same worldly path and have become so habituated to it that they don't know its uselessness. It has become monotonous due to lack of the divine will. The world has been degraded and made ugly by commercial activity and by hard work aimed at worldly gains. The beauty of nature is spoiled by man's industrial activity and the sweet smell of nature has been drowned in the bad smells that come from missions. The earth is now bare, having lost all living beauty. Man is insensitive to this barrenness. His feet cannot know whether the earth is soft or hard. In spite of man's activities tending to destroy the beauty of nature, it is inexhaustible. At the bottom of the world, there is freshness. This freshness never disappears. When spring comes, nature renews itself and thus shows underlying freshness. And although the sun goes down the western sky and the earth is plunged in darkness, the next day will dawn and the sun will be rising again in the eastern sky. Just as a dove with its warm breast broods over its young ones in its nest, so the Holy Ghost broods protectively over the world, which is bent in sleep and forgetfulness. Hopkins' philosophy here, here is called natural theology, that is, the study of how a creator might be seen 
through his creation. In Hopkins time, there were huge debates about whether the existence of God could be proved through evidence from nature. God has not just made a creation, he is present in it. Let us see the symbols used by Hopkins. The first symbol he uses is foil in the third line. From Hopkins' own writing, the image of shook foil seems to have been the one that fascinated him most. Hopkins uses this as a simile here in connection with the metaphor of the world being charged. Here he says that the world is so full of God's electricity that it will spark on contact. Hopkins uses the symbol of oil in the fourth line. The ooze of oil refers to when some oil bearing fruit such as an olive is crushed. This seems almost a contradictory image. A mere touch will produce a spark, then a wholesome crushing is needed to get oil ooze out. Hopkins uses images of fire to symbolize the passion behind religious feeling as well as to symbolize God and Christ. In God's grandeur, Hopkins compares the glory of God and the beautiful bounty of his world to fire, a miraculous presence that warms and beguiles those nearby. Nature's fire, lightning, appears in other poems as a way of demonstrating the innate science of God and Christ in the natural world. God and Christ appear throughout nature regardless of whether humans are there to witness their appearance. Birds appear throughout Hopkins' poetry frequently as they stand for God and Christ. Birds serve as reminders that there is life away from earth in heaven and the Holy Ghost is often represented as a dove. God's grandeur portrays the Holy Ghost literally as a bird big enough to brood over the entire world, protecting all its inhabitants. Here, the spirit is seen maternally a brooding bird with warm breast, a bold image to make concrete what would otherwise be a very abstract idea. As readers, we have come a long way in 14 lines from dramatic electrical imagery to quiet, feminine, nurturing imagery. Through this, we understand that the landscape of Hopkins is based on his own spirituality. Thus, Hopkins' sonnet, God's Grandeur, puts forth the idea that the world remains charged with the grandeur of God in spite of all mankind has done and is doing to pollute and pervert and tread out its radiance. God, through the constant presence of his own Holy Spirit, continues to rejuvenate physical nature as well as the human spirit and both are being made over anew. Thank you.